everybody. Welcome. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong. Let me share your screen and get us oriented to our conversation. All right, so tonight uh, we'll be doing our monthly book chat. Tonight we'll be discussing the book Fall Down Seven Times, Get Up Eight by Nayuki Higashida. Um, but first, if you're new to Brain Club, what is Brain Club? Um, it's our education program um, for purposes of providing education about All Brains Belong's approach to neuroinclusive community culture. It's the idea of bringing people together um, based on a shared vision, promoting new ways of thinking and being um, to then go out into the world um, and uh, bring bring that bring that uh, vision beyond Brain Club. This is a place where we hope that you'll feel safe. Um, it's a place to experience how culture can be different. It's a place to collectively learn and unlearn together. And although All Brains Belong has a variety of different types of programs, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. It's not a place to make personal requests or do individualized problem solving. This one, this one's for education. So we invite you to explore today's big picture themes and share ideas or reflections, um, you know, related to the, the, the topics that come up. And all paths to participate tonight are welcome. Um, you can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those neuronormative constructs. Please feel free to um, walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or anything else that needs doing. Um, observation is also a valid form of participation. Um, uh, nope, never, never, never pressure. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, we work really hard to try to make this be a safe experience for all participants and uh, by prioritizing the group's needs over that of the individual. So being really mindful of language used and um, thinking about everyone's access needs. Access needs being anything required for full and meaningful participation. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. And there's all different types of access needs. And some of the access needs that come up in a virtual program um, that we like to bring up up front. Um, first, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles or uh, hide subtitles if you change your mind. That's my visual support to make sure I have the chat open if anybody would like to be using it. And just to mention that sometimes the chat, we can have conflicting access needs, meaning access needs that um, are mutually exclusive to one another. And the chat is um, a great example of that because for many uh, participants, the chat is a way of making access possible. It's a way of communicating without mouth words. Um, you can take your time, have more processing time as new ideas come up. Um, and for other other participants, uh, the chat is uh, like it, it, a barrier to access because it's distracting, especially if it moves quickly. And some people even have a startle response when it pops up. So we like to upfront just name some ideas for navigating those conflicting access needs. If you are someone who the chat bothers you, some things to try. One is after the first time it pops up, try leaving it open so that it doesn't keep popping. It just pops once and stays up, which maybe can sometimes make it easier um, uh, on, on many brains. You can also try disabling chat preview by clicking on the little up arrow next to the chat bubble icon and um, clicking on the word show chat preview, which will get rid of the checkbox and hopefully it won't pop up anymore. If you're someone who uses the chat um, as part of your brain club participation, we just ask that you use the big box for all of your chat uses that we're going to try to avoid the reply or the threads because that is what um, actually makes the chat bounce and have more of a startle response and can make it really hard even for our staff to be able to respond to things. So we just ask that you type all your messages in the big box. Okay. 
Um, so um, before I get into our topic um, tonight, I did want to preview next, I'm going to make a couple of announcements. So the first thing I want to name is that um, uh, next month's Brain Club um, is a new topic, new topic for the new month. And July's topic will be bridging the double empathy problem. And this is a term we talk about a lot at Brain Club. This is a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK. And this term refers to um, when there is a mismatch of worldview and of communication style between different neurotypes, that is where miscommunication um, uh, uh, breaks down. And so um, often, often we, we, we don't necessarily talk about it that way. Um, where it's often um, it's, it's like thought about that there's like one type of social skill that is correct. Um, and then there's like us over here who don't communicate in that way. And that's of course not true. So the double empathy problem is about bridging that gap in both directions, which is something that we try to do at Brain Club all the time. So at uh, th through July, first I'll just name, there is no Brain Club next week. So um, uh, we'll be back in two weeks on the 9th. And I'm talking about the double empathy problem in all these different contexts, in relationships, in healthcare, in employment, um, and uh, and beyond. So that's announcement number one. Announcement number two, just save the date. Uh, the third annual Community Health Education Fair is coming up. Um, this year's event will be Saturday, August 24th. Um, there will be in-person activities on the State House lawn. There's a resource fair, live music, interactive art, activities, um, a quiet space to take a break, and that's the limelight restoration take a break zone, and a community storytelling series. It's like Brain Club in person, but with hybrid delivery, thanks to Orca Media, we'll also be able to broadcast that virtually. That part of the event will be from one to three. Um, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll have more information um, forthcoming. But it's like um, brain, uh, brain brain club hybrid brain club for this part of the event. So we hope whether you are local to Vermont um, or not, we hope that you can join us. And I have one more um, announcement. I don't have a slide for it. I just learned this like ten minutes ago. Um, Sarah shared the good news that uh, thus far in twenty twenty four. Our Kid Connections program has matched 85 sweet little loves. 85 sweet little loves. For those of you who don't know about this program, this is something we're really proud of here. Um, this is a free, customized friend matching program for kids and teens. It's completely free um, for participants age 4 to 17. They fill out a profile or their, or their caregiver or support person fills out a profile and Sarah makes a customized match to find all the sweet little loves a peer who loves what they love. Um, so we've had over 200 sweet little loves from uh, not, not just Vermont, but um, around the country, even in other countries, we've matched through this program. And anyway, really, really excited, really excited about that. So thanks for the good news, Sarah. All right. Finally ready for our book chat. So uh, this book, Fall Down Seven Times, Get Up Eight um, by Naoki Higashida. Um, so for those of you who have joined us for our, we've done we've done, done two book chats on The Reason I Jump, and this is the same author. Um, so Naoki, Naoki Higashida is a non-speaking communicator who wrote this whole book, in addition to all the other books, um, using a letter board. And uh, before we talk about the book, um, David's going to play a video so we can take a look at what it is like for Naoki to communicate using a letter board. Go for it, David. this as a big thing, the story of my hero, life to the world, and learn that people hold with 
autism and without find that my writing strikes a chord with their own experiences. We all seek the courage to end up again after falling down. Thanks, David. So, um, Naoki's first book, The Reason I Jump, that, that, um, that, that we've discussed here at Brain Club before, um, Naoki wrote the whole book communicated with that letter board, pointing to each letter. Um, and what we learned through reading that book was for many people, we learned so much about our own brains that this author, who had been 14 years old at the time in which The Reason I Jump had been written, was able to articulate with such exquisite precision um, his inner life. Um, and so it is again with this book. Um, I've decided to organize um, some of my favorite parts from this book um, into, into a, 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 I'll show you the framework in a second, but first I want to share um, Naoki's words about um, what, what he hopes that we take away from this book. By translating our states of mind into words, perhaps we can better grasp the reasons that underlie our insecurity. To live a positive life, understanding and acceptance are key. Seek the courage to stand up again after falling down. It would mean the world to me if this book could occasionally serve as a gentle nudge in the right direction. So um, to organize Naoki's uh, observations, um, I'm going to use a framework that we introduced in our webinar in September, the Shifting the Autism Narrative um, webinar. Um, um, and so in that webinar, we talked about the five buckets of autism, like the real deal of autism, not just like a description of autistic stress behaviors as listed as in the DSM. Um, where the real deal of what we know about autistic cognition is that um, autistic people are systems thinkers, um, differences in executive functioning, social communication, motor coordination, sensory processing. So um, the descriptions that we'll share um, uh, from this book, I organized into these buckets. Um, yeah, Martha, thank you so much. Um, we can put a link in the chat to that webinar for anybody who wants to watch it. There you go. Okay, so first bucket, systems thinking. So Naoki describes in a couple of different chapters in this book um, what it is like when things change. So I think for someone who is um, uh, uh, less familiar um, with autistic cognition, um, observable from the outside, it still may be observed that autistic people often, not always, um, struggle with deviations from a routine without necessarily connecting that to why. When you have the type of brain that derives safety from predictable systems, systems that make the world make sense, when those systems are deviated from, it legitimately can feel unsafe. So I'm gonna read this quote. When an agreed time is altered, or a destination is changed at the last minute. I can act as if the sky is falling in. I need time to accommodate my inner state to the change in plan. So that's also a nod to processing speed. Or this passage. 
To step outside our house is to encounter a host of situations in which the differences between myself and others soon become impossible to ignore. Some people might point to this as further proof of the world's harshness, but that's not actually how I see it. It's a matter of pace. At home, I can go about my daily routines of my own speed or at my own speed, and this relates to feeling comfortable and secure. Sorry, Martha, so all the quotes are all coming from this same book. Um, fall down seven times, get up eight. And Lizzie, would you be able to link that book in the chat? That's this, 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 uh, all of the quotes tonight are coming from that book. Bucket number two, motor coordination. When I have a picture in my head of the completed task, the sequence of steps I need to take to turn that picture into reality stays unclear. I might watch somebody doing the job I need to do, but my mind won't quite grasp that I'm free to follow suit. To me, when I read this, that's a description of dyspraxia, um, the difficulties with motor planning and sequencing. Um, for many, um, I think it's said that something like 86.7% uh, of autistic people have some degree of dyspraxia. And so difficulty with planning and sequencing motor activities that can impact your big body movements, your hand-eye coordination, even getting your eyes to track linearly while you're reading something, um, it, 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 it really takes a very big toll. And um, what we know is that this is a, um, a part of someone's experience that they may not have language to describe why some things are so hard and why there is often a huge gap between an idea like and the intention and being able to implement something without certain types of accommodations, like for example, a visual support that breaks a step down into substeps or video modeling or you know any number of things but it's not as simple as like, I remember in medical school, like it was just assumed, you know, um, here, I'm gonna do a thing, you watch, and now you'll be able to do that thing. Well, there are some brains that learn that way. Not all brains learn that way. Or how about this one? Being unable to do what I normally can, even trivial things, is a big deal for me in a bad way. Once upon a time, even with this clear explanation, I might have lost it completely and gone to pieces. It's okay, and so he goes on to say that now that, now that he understands as a framework of this, it's okay that it's impossible to fix. Um, and then he can move on now. And so this is, I think, a nod to the, the notion of fluctuating capacity. Sometimes I can do the thing, sometimes I can't. That is the norm for most dyspraxic people. Um, where when um, someone is well rested, has had you know a right amount of protein and hydration, um, doesn't have sensory chaos, is has you know a, a regulated nervous system, has enough dopamine. Um, Maybe able to do and, and maybe able to do the thing, um, but when when those things are not in alignment, something that um, might be able to be accessed in one moment may not be able to be accessed in another moment, and that is so common. Um, uh, I I taught my now seven year old. Uh, we've been talking about dyspraxia since they're three because I think that is like just knowing that that is the norm. Um, especially when you have the kind of brain that derives safety from predictable systems, if it's predictable that sometimes I can do the thing and sometimes I can't, that's the system as opposed to 
I can do the thing. We, the system is not being applied. Reading in the chat, Monique says, the more I unmask, the less capacity I have to do the thing. At least that's how it seems. I'm thinking it's my brain and nervous system working out dysregulation and will eventually, eventually come into more balance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martha sharing about the cognitive load um, alleviated by retirement. Yeah. So lots of people, this dyspraxia is uh, resonating. Um, actually, there's one more quote I'll read um, about motor coordination. As I grew up, I came to understand that because of my autism, there are some things that other people do which I will never master, no matter how hard I try. The memory of this realization wounded my spirit and remains in my heart like a thorn that cannot be extracted. I assumed this wound would be with me forever. However, I have grown to be able to do a number of things that I couldn't do when I was young. Bucket number three, executive functioning. Following the beaten path of a fixed pattern is preferable by far to the stress of not knowing what choice I ought to be making. And he goes on to describe both um, the like decision paralysis. He doesn't use those language, but that's what he's describing. He also describes when people who are supporting him clearly have their own agenda and he's trying to make choices um, in efforts to please that person by um, trying to guess what their agenda is. I think many, many people um, here at Brain Club have described that for sure. I'm reading in the chat, uh, Martha says, uh, what is so sad and ironic um, is that uh, physically disabled people don't always have a sadness about not being able to do what others do. I think everybody's different um, in terms of uh, what their experience is. Um, but for some reason, we autistics grieve that terribly and feel somehow shamed because we are not like others in terms of um, all these things. Yeah, right. I mean, it's the whole idea that there is no one correct way to be a person. There is no one right way to think, to learn, to communicate, to experience the world, to move. Um, and, and, and as we have, as we try to unpack here at Brain Club often, you know, systemic ableism runs deep and starts early. And it's, a, it's, 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 it's really connected to all of the other discriminatory isms that in any way insinuate that there is like, that any group of people are superior to any other group of people. Yeah. Um, Sierra says, I think anyone who's living in a world that expects us to be or do something that's not how our brains and bodies work, there's always going to be othering and trauma related to that, right? Trauma, shame, all of that, yeah. This is another description of executive functioning. Having nothing to do in the present moment has the same impact on me as having nothing to do for the rest of eternity would. As long as I'm in motion, I feel as if I could become a valid member of society. That feeling, I think, brings solace. Yes, here exactly. This speaks so much to inertia. So inertia, the physics concept, an object in motion either stays in motion or the object that's not moving stays not moving. And so those two flavors, um, difficulty initiating, can't start doing the thing, foot on the brake versus the other flavor of inertia. I start doing the thing and now I can't stop doing the thing. I can't stop talking. I can't stop moving. I can't stop scrolling on social media. Um, 
both of these manifestations are um, dopamine deficiency. So this is, I, I thought this was an exceptional description of inertia. So this one refers to um, the way that Naoki is describing how his memory is organized. Um, and he, he wrote about this in The Reason I Jump as well. But in, in this book, he writes, um, my memory consists of continuous dots. It's not linear. Experiences become stars in the sky one by one. My memories are arranged here, or sorry, arrayed here and there in three dimension. Some stars I can reach out and touch, while others are hundreds of millions of light years away. So it's the idea of like non-linear thinking and organization of memories. Why are some memories so salient, even though they were such a long time ago? And why is this other thing not salient at all? Um, actually, one more quote I'll read about memory. I have put a lot of effort to distinguishing memory rain, like rain, like the weather, memory rain, if I want to avoid triggering bad flashbacks. To do so, my mind tends to give priority to organizing ahead what actions I might take. Thinking about what actions I need to take right at this moment. So um, again, um, earlier we spoke about when things change. If 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 your brain has made some plans to um, inform your regulation about how you get through an experience, and that thing changes, that can be really hard. Bucket number, I think we're up to bucket number four, communication. Back in the days when I had no ways of communicating at all, I was extremely lonely. People who have never experienced this will go through life never knowing how soul crushing the condition of wordlessness is. If I tried to describe what it's like to be nonverbal, it's the word that he uses, in the world of the verbal. In a single word, I choose this one, agony. This is also true that if we know there's even a single person who understands what it's like for us, that's solace enough to give us hope. This was something he also wrote about in The Reason I Jump, um, where he spoke in that book about um, why does he ask the same question over and over again? And he describes like many reasons for, for, for why that is. So now he's talking about um, why we, meaning he, still can't answer the same question. So he writes, to get a handle on a question he's asked, first, I have to sift through my memory for scenes where similar questions were asked. Then I have to summon up and deploy the words that worked in those matching scenes last time around. Of course, in reality, not everything about the remembered scene is going to match. That passage really stayed with me as a parent. It has just keeping it, keeping it in my brain has helped me think about how hard it is for many brains to answer questions. Um, answering questions, particularly open-ended questions, um, can be really, really hard for many brains. 
which is why um, like in our medical practice, we try not to ask very many questions. We try to do even clinical interviewing using declarative language, turning questions into statements um, because it is um, calling upon a different part of the brain that might be um, might have more access. This one. I never know I'm saying the wrong thing until I hear myself saying it. The pain of being unable to do what we'd like to do already is hard to live with. Pain arising from other people's reactions to our mistakes can break our hearts. Martha, sometimes I don't have slides for all of the passages. Reading Ariana's comment. This is such amazing insight um, and makes so much sense when you think about echolalia and gestalt language processors. Absolutely, that's exactly right. So um, echolalia um, being either immediate, so this is, these are like chunks of words that get repeated back either immediately or delayed. Um, and so, you know, the song that's stuck in your head forever, that's delayed echolalia, for example, this is very, very common. Um, and um, gestalt language processors, um, uh, learn language, acquire language, and use language often with these, these chunks of, of, of words that go together as phrases. Oh, you're not a pest at all, not at all. Um, um, Weaver says, unclear, non-specific questions, especially in passive voice, can immediately send me into overwhelm. It causes a frantic cascade in my mind as I scramble to figure out what they might mean. Right, especially when you are interacting with someone for whom your one's own nervous system has, um, it does not feel safe. Of like, there's something about this environment, there's something about the dynamic with this person that they have an agenda and it does not, it's not safe for me here. Oh, and so for, for, for all that, this one actually did have a slide. I should have tried it. Regulation. To display your emotions is, after all, to put your whole self up for scrutiny. Perhaps total exposure of the self is not even possible. Can be unfathomable things and therefore hidden even to the self. Emotions, as everyone surely knows, are also what makes us human. So uh, sometimes people talk about um, it feeling uncomfortable or unsafe to be perceived. Um, and this, this reminds me of that. When I get pent up or wound up, I simply can't diffuse the situation and I get more and more agitated until I'm like a perilously overinflated balloon and even the tiniest thing will make me explode by biting my sleeve with all the strength I can muster it's like the air is slowly let out of the balloon and gradually I return to my usual calm self. imagery of the overinflated balloon, really powerful. So again, in a world where, you know, as we're also often talking about at Brain Club, that behavior is communication. Um, so, so much behavior is attempts at regulation. So this is a description of biting his sleeve as an attempt to regulate powerful. My motive for running off when I was younger was that I hated myself so much that I didn't want anyone else to even see me, I'm guessing. 
I yearned to vanish from the world. This wasn't quite the same thing as wanting to be dead. It was a severe inability to accept myself for who and what I was. I was also convinced that one day someone would come along and rescue me from everything. And I wanted to hide myself until when that day arrived. Wow. Yeah. A lot of resonance in the chat about that one. Even if I'm having a really bad time of it and someone urges me to go off somewhere and cool down on my own, doing so isn't at all straightforward. Bad times can blow up out of nowhere and any safe place or chill out room offered to me appears to my eyes as infinitely distant, even if it's right there in front of me. I know I can visit safer rooms, but if I were able to go there by myself midway through a meltdown, I'd also be able to indicate that I need help. Unfortunately, I can do neither. I hope that one day caregivers and professionals will be able to help people whose autism prevents them from showing they need help before it's too late. I'll let that one sit in. So this is really talking about co-regulation, the idea that nervous systems can impact other nervous systems for good or for bad, right? And so when someone is significantly dysregulated, people of all ages often have an access need for co-regulation by another nervous system. It is, an, it is a, a truly ableist notion, the idea that, you know, once you're this age, you will be able to self-regulate all the time and not need an interdependence with another nervous system. That's ableism. It's just, and it's it's also just not true. It's not it's not based in brain science. Sarah, I I I agree. Right, I think many people, many people struggle with that. Right. It's the unlearning. It's the internalized ableism. The thinking that it quote should be possible. Because you were told that. We were all told that. It's just not true. Using a lot of impulse control, I was going to tell a story. I'm not going to. Yes, I am. It was brought to my attention um, that, um, a local school official recently stated that since there are no sensory rooms to take a break at the grocery store, a sweet little love should therefore not require one at school. Ex like, anyway. I needed a lot of co-regulation when I heard that story. <sighs> Ableism everywhere. another passage. For me, success is not some invigorating emotional experience, like taking in the view from the summit of a high mountain. 
It's more like walking a high wire barefoot in a circus tent. Once you reach the far side, you'll earn your round of applause, but the big drop down can happen at any moment. That resonated hard for me. Some people with autism, by the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Um, you know, we talk a lot, we talk about this at Brain Club often that there are different types of language that people use to describe their, their own neurodivergence. And so um, some people use um, identity first language. Uh, like for example, I refer to being autistic about my own self because um, for me, autism is a uh, part of my identity. Um, there are other people who use person first language, such as person with autism. And so, um, you know, uh, so, so this is Naoki's expression to describe his own experience of autism. Um, okay, continue. Um, some people with autism go into a meltdown at the very sight of someone else getting a major scolding. The real reason that the person is that the person is shaken up so badly is because they are experiencing the scene as one where they are getting blamed for their own flaws and defects witnessing the anger is a trigger for a panic attack which then snowballs into a full meltdown at the at, as the neurotypical onlooker gets trapped in a spiral of self-loathing for having had a panic attack in the first place. Nobody's accusing them of anything at all, but they nonetheless experience blame and suffer the full stress. The reason why the person being told off is being told off, I suspect it rarely enters the equation at all. We got a, besides the five buckets, we got a couple of other categories. So this one, um, this is what, um, what we need from supporters, according to Naoki. It's important, sorry, it's important for helpers and therapists to ask themselves, if I was the person I'm helping, would it be useful? It would be useful if they double checked that the assistance they're offering is a real relevance to the person and not about gratifying their own desire to care. This one I don't think has a, this one I don't think has a slide. Um, have you ever thought Quote, this person couldn't have performed that action unless they had understood what I was saying. Regrettably, I can't avoid concluding that too often, too many people interpret those of us with autism in ways and for reasons that serve their own interest first and ours a distant second. Teachers and helpers who think of themselves as infallible never stop to consider that they themselves could be connected with a child's unwelcome behavior. Please reflect upon what's going on. So that's co-dysregulation. Um, the idea that the lens that even someone views you can impact one's threat detection system. 
So when any one of all ages is dysregulated, it may be coming from um, the nervous system of, an, of another. Um, this, this uh, you know, not only does this describe like so much of what goes on at school, in the workplace, um, like this is how it is in my house a lot of the time where my, my, my energy is contributing to my child's dysregulation, conflicting access needs, co-dysregulation. This is what goes on. Praise is not the fast track to self-acceptance. Praise derives from the judgment of others. This is distinct from whether an action truly went well or not. It is separate from how we think and feel inside of ourselves. Many people seem to buy into the belief that praise boosts our will to succeed and nourishes our confidence, but I'm not sure if that's always the case. My child, when they were like five, I think, um, I like did some neuronormative like clappy cheer thing when they did something and they looked right at me and they said, don't you expect I'm going to do this again? Point well taken. It really felt like I was trapped in a school for infants whenever I was praised for doing something that by rights only a young child should be praised for. felt as if my future were deferred infinitely yet again. When I've fallen into a bad mental place and I'm furious at myself for having fallen here, here's how I'd like you to handle me. Please let me work through it. If I'm kind of at war with myself, without control over my emotions, nothing you say is going to get through to me. Become even tempered when I'm mid meltdown and don't try to talk me out of it. Reprimanding me while I'm struggling to master emotions carries this real risk. The words you can use all too easily get tangled up with my anger and complaints, which in turn can create a new verbal fixation. Your words will then stir me up even more, and I'll be reacting and provoked by them in spite of my best efforts. If I'm only battling my emotions, the sooner I'll be able to exercise control. Uh, Gail, I absolutely agree. A great message for parenting in general. Like I've th this this passage has really stayed with me and has like given me some structure. It's hard. Like you you re you react. Like you know you react when someone's dysregulated, um, even like in a well-intentioned way, but it, it often, um, it's a demand. It's a demand on another nervous system to process more auditory input. It's not helpful for many brains. Acquiring superpowers of endurance is not something children need to be learning before they enter society at large. People with no experience of being bullied have no idea how miserable it is to grow up being picked on the whole time. I would like people to stop pressuring children to make friends. Friendships can't be artificially created. 
people whose respect and mutual support occurs naturally is what's needed instead. Yeah, and I think that that ableism of, you know, preparing people for the real world and like, do, 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 like it's, it's, it's ableist. When I fight the demands of my fixations and when my urge to do what my fixation dictates and my determination to ignore it smash into each other, I can erupt into anger. I erupt into anger. I start hitting my head. I want to take control of the situation, but my brain won't let me. Once I've mastered a fixation, I'm able to set its demands aside and then I can come to ignore what my brain is saying and act according to my own wishes and feelings. If people try to tell me off um, and try to forcibly stop me from doing something or yell, what are you doing at me? I become utterly dejected. The more frantic and desperate I become, the more I punch myself. And by now, it's no longer about punishing my brain's comments. It's about punishing myself. Or having lost the plot so for having lost the plot so woefully. However, if people don't flip out at the sight of me and understand that I'm not fully in control at such times, their forbearance gives me the headspace to think that one way or another I have to stop myself. And the next time you see someone like me in mid meltdown, I ask you to conduct yourself with this knowledge. Wow. Right. And this is talking about shame. When someone shames you when you're already feeling awful, that makes it worse. My fixations can hang around a long time before they disappear. However much effort, however much effort I put into trying to free myself from these obsessive behaviors, they remain really stubborn. I want them to stop and I suffer because we can't make them go away. For myself, the only cure I know is for you to give up, give us and our fixations time. You can help us by staying with us as we work through our fixations by not reproaching us too much for exhibiting them and by maintaining an unswerving belief that one day we will be free of that because they don't last forever. Um, brain fixations can just up and vanish, and some sit as a demonic curse has lifted itself. Naturally, people in our lives point our obsessive behaviors out to us because they want us to stop doing them. I would ask you not to reprimand us in ways that damage our dignity. Believe me, the biggest victim of, this, of a fixation is the person who suffers from it. Martha, I think when, when he uses the word fixations, he's talking about like intrusive thoughts, like intrusive thoughts um, or sometimes like compulsive behaviors that relate to the intrusive thoughts. I think that's what he's describing. I say that only because he uses the word like a lot in this book and that's like the context clues I picked up on. The last thing I will read from this section um, in what we need from supporters. Lessons don't tend to stick if I'm shown how to do things on the heels of being told off for not doing them correctly. It's really important that we work out for ourselves why we can't master a skill and what we can then do about it. Um, last section, culture and identity. What I wish to say is this, the value of a person shouldn't be fixed solely by his or her skills and talents or lack of them. It's how you strive to live well that allows others to understand your awesomeness as a human being. I liked this one. 
I don't want to be a one of a kind only flower in the world. I prefer to be the kind of flower you can find all over the world in any old place. We see so few role models of people living contentedly with autism. We have no choice but to live in a society where autism is thought of exclusively as a sorrow and a hardship. That fact triggers further sorrow and hardship. How would you feel if you were obliged to undergo medical treatment for the sole reason of the person you are isn't inconvenient? Not medicine to alleviate a symptom, but intent to affect a brash change to who and what you are and remove all meaning from everything you thought was beautiful and precious. Ooh. One sit in. This isn't to say that all of us are delighted to be the way we are all the time, but I refuse to accept it when people view us as incomplete or partial human beings. I prefer to believe that people with autism are every bit as whole as everyone else. We might be different from the majority in diverse ways, but why are these differences negative things? Inhabiting my mind is a person who is me and yet isn't me. I talk to my other me as if he were an old friend. This is why it's especially important to never hate your, ourselves. When you start hating yourself, this old companion draws away. It's easier to maintain your self-esteem Sorry, it's not easy to maintain your self-esteem if you're constantly feeling removed from your ideal self. This is the last quote. A long time ago, I used to dream that I was a neurotypical child. In my dreams, I was forever laughing chatting away and swapping jokes with my friends and family. Dream me forgot all about real me here in the waking world. I would wake up and return to myself, but I'd be clueless about where I was or what on earth I was doing in this place. That strangely, perhaps, even though I envy my dream me, these days, it's a bit of a relief to get back to who I really am. Now I realize that my dream me is also a fake me. I might have longed once to become that neurotypical version of myself, but really it was the, the only in the way that a child would want to be the hero in a film. It might let us see things fresh, but they are illusions. This is my world. There is no other. And I appreciate so many of you for sharing your experiences in the chat as, as, as we went. And I think that there, like not to say that it's a fast track, but any mean, by any means, but I think that being part of a community where people are talking about this and naming this and unlearning this stuff together, I think that's, that's how we begin the process of unlearning. I don't, I think it's very hard to, to shift those like 
over-rehearsed neural pathways to really shift those self-narratives. I think it's very hard to do that in a vacuum. And I think it's about, you know, coming together with, with, with this community at Brain Club or otherwise um, to do this work together. And uh, Sarah, thank you. I'm gonna wrap up with Sarah's quote in the chat. Um, we are not alone, we are here together. It's a beautiful way to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here tonight and being part of this book chat. And uh, remember, we do not have Brain Club next week, um, but we'll be back in two weeks um, to be discussing a double empathy problem in relationships. I hope you have a good couple of weeks. Thank you all so much. Bye.